These theater masks will never fail to make millions think of that one English lesson in high school. Rooted in Greek history, these masks with happy and sad expressions are attributed to comedy and tragedy. When we juxtapose comedy and tragedy, especially in the climate of entertainment we have today, we can see that the two are separated by a thinner line than one might expect. Dark, morbid, and edgy humor has been on the rise since I was a child, often making light of fairly tragic events. But making light of serious things for the sake of laughs is far from new in our society, especially when it comes to violence. As subjective as humor can be, the line between a dark, satirical joke and just a joke that's in bad taste can be hard to see, especially when you're a 20-something who's new to the world and has no idea what you're doing. A lot goes into determining whether a story is funny, sad, thought-provoking, or just kinda gross. And when it comes to dancing around these lines in an interesting and chaotic way, I can't think of any better example than Wilford Worfstash. He's arguably Markiplier's most iconic character, and the emotions he can invoke and meaning he conveys may not be what you'd expect at first glance. In this video, we'll be taking a look at how he does this in three parts. First, the experimental origins of 2010's humor, then the tragedy and chaos introduced in Who Killed Markiplier, and his impact on Markiplier's storytelling, especially in Aswin. Don't forget to like and subscribe! YouTube had a very different climate in the early 2010s, especially in gaming circles, and many channels were rife with emboldened gamers using slurs and disparaging jokes. The kids who'd run around the internet watching stuff on Newgrounds while their parents weren't looking had all become adults who thought they were funny. What's up? Was there a dead baby dangling at the end of it? What? It's just like, I have a dark sense of humor, <laughs> so... <clears throat> yeah, um, anyway, yes. What, what was the joke? I could make a whole video exploring the pros and cons of edgy humor, but to summarize what I feel is relevant for this video, I'll give you this. In my humble opinion, edginess doesn't have to be crass, irritating, or malevolent in nature. Edginess doesn't come from a desire to let the troll out of the dungeon or be a contrarian dickweed. I'd say it's akin to a punk ass's curiosity that's drenched in angst and nihilism. It's natural for a growing person to want to test their environment, not because they want to hurt it, but better understand it. It can also help them understand themselves better and how much control or freedom they truly have. The edge in question is really just a line between what's an awful thing to say or believe and what's funny and thought-provoking. When an edgelord throws out a joke, a douchebag edgelord targets here, where what I consider a true edgelord targets here. Of course, where their jokes actually land may be another story. Edgelords aren't inherently bad and cringely so much as more likely to pull up bad and cringy results. If you have a teenager dealing with constant injustice and demands of restraint with no clear reason why, just add a rebellious nature and a little self-righteousness and you've got the perfect recipe for an edgelord. That's way too edgy, edgelord. Why don't you get on the bus and go to school? Why don't you get on your knees and pray for death? Some of you might be wondering how this preamble is relevant, and some of you may have an idea. Wilford's first appearance was in a skit video Markiplier made 10 years ago called The Fall of Slenderman, and this well-loved and well-watched introduction to the character has this in the first 10 seconds. The Slenderman, once the most feared creature in all of existence, now a registered sex offender. <laughs> Personally, I think the funniest part about this clip is that Markiplier thought it was funny. And yet, this joke, and the many better jokes made through Warpstash, manages to avoid the largest pitfalls of edgy humor, to the extent that they might not register as edgy. In my humble and totally not biased in any way opinion, Mark does this both in how he frames these dark jokes and through Warpstash's characterization. If you look closely, there's a lot about Warpstash that helps soften the blow of these controversial topics. Number one, Warpstash is the joke. Much like how The Fall of Slender Man is meant to mock the horror game character as a malevolent loser, Warpstash is oftentimes the target of Markiplier's jokes and skits. Dark and edgy humor often crosses the line when the target of their jokes are victims, minorities, or some type of group or person that's already at an unfair disadvantage, hence the term punching down. The best way to avoid this is to punch up at groups with unfair advantages, or groups that are defined by committing reprehensible behavior like, say, a sex offender. Run stupider! When I want action, I want stupid. 
<laughs> Markiplier's skits revolve around characters of the latter two groups, and even when the characters aren't punching up, they instead end up punching themselves. In a Syndigo skit, where Warpstash is caught having an affair, he panics about getting caught and impulsively shoots all witnesses, including a dog. And it's also implied he shoots a baby. It's hard to get much darker than dead babies, but the joke isn't dead babies. Instead, the joke is this guy is such a moron, he thought a baby could tattle on his affair. The butt of the joke is the baby murderer, not the baby itself. That said, the baby actually survives and shoots Warpstash in another skit. Which is a great segue into point two, animated absurdism. As I pointed out earlier, animation can use art style and its own laws of physics to trivialize terrifying situations, making them silly or absurd within their universe. This disconnect from our own reality makes it easier to distance ourselves from the subject at hand. Not only are Markiplier's skits full of absurd moments that aren't possible in real life, but Warpstash himself has characteristics more akin to a Looney Tune than a human being. His mannerisms are over-exaggerated, his appearance is atypical to us viewers, and his bouncy energy adds into the ridiculousness of his actions. We reconfirm that we're not punching down on any real people because he's so firmly differentiated from real people, as is his reality differentiated from ours. It was an accident, I swear. None of this means that Markiplier never made a single mistake when messing around with this type of humor. The most problematic thing I can think of to point out is the more than a bit mild queer coding of Warpstash. Overall, Warpstash seemed to give Markiplier a safe playground to play in until he found what worked for him and his audience. He would eventually lean further into absurdism than anything else, but never completely detach from darker themes. Come on, kill me. I'm here. Come on, do it now, kill me! Alright, if you say so, I mean, yeah. best of it. I can't speak to how much of this Markiplier did purposefully or thoughtfully. In fact, I doubt he intended anything but to run with jokes he liked. But either way, after Fall of Slenderman and the Five Nights at Freddy's interview, the jaw-waggling, mustache-bearing wackadoo was firmly cemented into his brand and fandom's interests, as a character perfect for fun and humor. And then, five years ago, Mark would take this fun and humorous character and pull him across a different line. Not the edgy line between funny and unfunny, but the line between comedy and tragedy. Before we do part two, a word from our sponsor. Hi everybody, my name is Edeha, and I made a fan game. And for the foreseeable future, I have no plans to shut up about it. It's got Warfstash, Actomark, Darkplier, a somebody, and this asshole. Miss Rockintooth has the playthrough on her VOD channel if you want to watch it, but if you want to see the game with less bugs and new bonus features, like an after credits scene, you gotta play it. You don't need an HDO account, you don't need to own RPG Maker, you just need a Windows computer to download it and to unzip the zipped file. So if you like horror games and my particular interpretation of Markiplier lore, why not give it a try? Link will be in the description down below. Edha is not an affiliate of Markiplier. This fan game is not meant to represent the Markiplier brand in any way. This game contains themes of unreality, transphobia, CPTSD, and other heavy topics. This game is not intended for ages 13 and under. By the time Warpstash reached purely original content from Markiplier, a lot of the edges were rounded off leaving us with a goofball with no concept of death or consequences, as well as casual meta-bending in a Deadpool type of way. He was the oldest and most recognizable amongst all the egos, which is why the paradigm shift in Who Killed Markiplier had such a strong impact on the fandom. I've talked at length about how Who Killed Markiplier impacted Darkiplier as a character, but he wasn't the only ego whose backstory was radically changed. In this series, the first character we are introduced to is the Colonel, characterized as a friendly but eccentrically dramatic man that's the prime suspect of a mysterious murder. Investigation of murder. Despite an impulsively violent nature, the Colonel is still fairly sympathetic and relatable. We see his frustration with his strained relationships, all while showing us an earnest and playful side, emphasized by strange and random breaks in reality when we're around him. The pool hasn't aged today. Geronimo! When we come to the climax of the series, it heavily involves the Colonel's story arc. When his friends have been mysteriously taken by a supernatural force, the Colonel begins to suspect the detective is behind it, unexpectedly giving us a scene that many have described as heart-wrenching. Where is he? He took them from me! my friends from me. The biggest hints on who the Colonel really is are subtle, but were easy enough for longtime viewers to catch on. Even with much of the story being hard to follow, because reasons, the Colonel's arc is arguably the most clear to us. 
the sanity is heavily impacted by two events. When he accidentally kills the viewer, only for us to get back up right in front of him. Are you dead? I, I, I mean, of course, you're not dead. You're not, how could you be dead? I, I, I wouldn't have killed you. I, I didn't kill you. I didn't kill anybody. Did Damien put you up to this? Of course he did. Where are you? If a viewer could take nothing else away from the story, they took this tragic tone from what happens to the Colonel. A tone that recontextualizes even the most innocuous of skits featuring Warfstash. I've heard you've done a great deal of charity work. While the story of who killed Markiplier is what transforms the character, much of this was more strongly established in Markiplier's follow-up to the series. Simply titled, Wilford Mother Loving Warfstash, aka Wamalawa. From this point on, Markiplier is able to utilize the character Warfstash to shift his stories from silly to serious very, very quickly. Stories like these are far from the first to be able to shift from a comedic scene to a dramatic or tragic tone, but it does do so in a way that is a bit different than most. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say we try and measure how a scene shifts from one side of the line to the other with these three gauges, perspective, tone, and realism. This is a bit of an oversimplification, but work with me here. With perspective, if we're shown a tragic story from the victim's view, we tend to relate to them more and thus feel their emotions within a scene, versus when we're pulled back to third person or an outsider's type of view. Tone in this medium in particular is usually controlled by filmy things like lighting, music, shot types, color saturation, etc. Realism is all about what we can suspend disbelief on as a realistic event, what's grounded in our sense of reality. In order to communicate to the audience what type of story they're watching, creators will pull the gauges in the same direction around the same time to keep it from feeling weird or off or confusing. Here's an example. Anyone else remembered Rocket Jump? They had a web series called Video Game High School, and it is exactly what it sounds like. The story is, for the most part, a wild and bizarre type of comedy, the very premise of it being almost impossible to take seriously. Many of the characters are unhinged, and the climax of each season's end holds tension as we watch this teenager try to navigate and succeed in an unpredictable universe, a teen who only fits the straight man trope in comparison to the other characters. It's fun and exciting, and in season 3, we got a very, very unexpected turn when tragedy strikes one of the characters. Teddy here, played by Jimmy Wong, has an objectively terrible relationship with his father, who ignores and abuses him to a degree that is absurd in and of itself. Teddy still acts like his father is the best father he could ever have, and the subject is often played up for laughs. But then, Teddy's father dies in an accident, and the show pulls no punches when exploring this. As soon as Teddy's friends learn what happened, every gauge starts to shift from one side to the other. There's changes in framing, and shots have longer pauses. Even before the perspective focuses on Teddy, we're shown how the weight of this is impacting the people around him. All the weird shenanigans and absurdisms of the world are gradually dropped. In a poetic way, there's even an in-story laugh track that's literally switched off as Teddy's friends prepare to tell him the news. When we do focus on Teddy, the colors desaturate as we focus on his emotional state, as he struggles to adjust and accept what's happened. It's important that we let you know it's okay for you to cry in front of us. Why would I do that? <laughs> that's lame. Because Ted, your dad just died. Yeah, doing what he loved, riding a motorcycle without a helmet. These jokes aren't made to get a laugh out of us anymore. They're made to show the disconnect Teddy has, show that he's trying to mask his feelings, even now. Even the way this tragedy comes up so suddenly in the middle of an episode makes it even more realistic to how a sudden loss feels. I think this is so well done, with every aspect of this medium of storytelling working together to give us a real, serious moment amidst the wacky chaos of the show. Wamulawa well, does a similar type of shift, but with one key difference. It starts out like a noir parody, following Abe, the detective, as he narrates his journey to hunt down the man that shot him and who killed Markiplier. A lot of people died because of this man. 
William J. Damn it. This short video is clearly meant to be goofy, at least at first. But then the noir tone gets interrupted, and colors literally returning to the world the moment we see Warp Stash. And when the detective finally confronts him, we arrive at the story's first turn in direction. Get down on the ground! Get down on the ground right now! Well, why'd the music stop? You're not getting away from me this time, asshole. Do I know you, friend? I said get down on- What? How do you not- Stop playing games! This shift is not gradual, and not only does the absurdism remain, it gets worse. Yet neither the jarring switch or the absurdism takes away from the seriousness in tone. It's actually a part of why it is serious. How do you not know who I am? In what universe where I've been chasing you all this time, how do you not know? Like These kind of shifts would normally leave us lost and uncertain, muddying the tone, and the storytelling would just fall apart, leaving us with no reason to care about what's happening. But while we are confused, it's Warpstash himself that saves this, and he's why these things actually serve the story. While nothing in the past few seconds has made any sense, we still feel that there has to be a reason, especially since it all seems to surround one guy. We don't know what's going on, but we do know that something is going on. That the breaks of reality's rules are tied together somehow. And you're not just confused by this scene. It's a very specific type of, huh? Personally, I've felt this way off and on ever since I was a kid. In fact, I'd say I experienced this specific type of confusion in part because I am on the spectrum. This is pure conjecture, I have no idea how right I am, but I have noticed that a great deal of the Markiplier fandom, at least the ones active in online fandom spaces, will often be autistic, ADHD, or even a wombo combo. And I think that's because there's something about the type of confusion that Markiplier emulates in his work. You have some idea of what's going on, but you know you're missing key pieces to how the world around you functions, and how you're supposed to feel about certain situations, and it leaves this weird tension in your mind that's hard to reconcile. I grew up with this tension and confusion in my life, and Mark himself has ADHD, so I wouldn't be surprised if it felt familiar and resonated with other folks on the spectrum like me. It probably does, I think. Please leave a comment if it did, I like validation. Either way, said tension is hard to capture or recreate. Turning the absurdity of the situation up on its own isn't going to inherently get us this result. Warstash being the focal point works, because we already know that he's capable of messing with the world around him in weird and interesting ways. It also helps to have the no-nonsense straight man as our foil and perspective character. One important thing is one of these names surprises him. If he's been looking at these things forever and ever and ever, why would one of these names surprise him? Why would why would one of them surprise him like he's reading it for the first time? Like he's like this speech, he's been waiting. He's just he's been waiting for it. You, like, you could see it in him. Ooh, I'm gonna get you. Like this is his time. Like his oh all this. E look at all this evidence. Look at all. Just look at the evidence. He's, ooh, you go look at the evidence. As is like, and then like, but one name doesn't ring true. Like that's just a little clue that I wanted in there. Some of the best horror films out there will not show the monster or main villain for quite some time, as this creates tension in that the characters don't know how the monster operates or what weaknesses they have, thus leaving them defenseless, uncertain, and fearful. Abe's horrified reactions as weirder and weirder things happen is another key part to why the absurdism works. Because to him, he's dealing with a monster with powers beyond his comprehension, and the less he understands about Warpstash, the less he understands of his own universe, the more terrified he becomes. How the hell do you keep doing that?! This confusion and tension escalates, up until he's faced with something so absurd, so reality-bending, that it shatters his entire worldview, sending us into disturbing territory not unlike what you get in Soma. What would you say our, uh, our closest encounter was before this very moment right here? That's easy. It was when we... When... We, uh... You... That's when you, uh, <clears throat> You fled the country to, uh... Um... All right, all right, yeah, 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 yeah you, you, were, you were off the radar for three years, but I got a hot tip that you shacked up in, uh... In, um, uh... You shacked up! At this point, we've been shown enough cliches of the noir trope, along with other tropes and weird oddities, for us to finally pick up what's going on. That Abe, a fictional character, is having his story completely derailed by Warpstash. 
and is struggling to see the world beyond his role as a detective. He doesn't remember the details of what year things happened where because the details don't exist. All that exists is what directly serves the story, but he can't piece that together from where he is. He's not aware that there's a fourth wall. There is an odd tragedy in this, but Warpstash has an answer to this tragedy that's similar to how he handled his own. It was a bit of a shock for me too, but I think the stress is getting to you a little bit. You need to unwind. You're, you're a freshly born fawn trying to find your legs in a world that doesn't make sense. Let's forget about all the, the, the chasing and the killing and the shooty shooty bang bang God, you're a murderer. <laughs> and just for tonight, why don't we have a little fun? This video ends in a more lighthearted way than Who Killed Markiplier, and shows us how Warfstash embraces the chaotic nature of his life and just runs with it, and learns to appreciate it where he can. None of this makes any sense. That's the beauty of it. This isn't the last we see of the tragic nature of his character. Well, that's terrifying. There's a creepy horror atmosphere to the fairly short interactive story called the Warfstash Automated Interview Automaton. Or for short. Anyway, though, is obviously built out of a Five Nights at Freddy's reference, but still has a fairly comedic lean, centering around an animatronic who is programmed based off of a brain scan of Warfstash. It becomes quite clear that there's a lot more of Warfstash in this guy than it seems, directly referencing who killed Markiplier. Like Ted from Video Game High School, Warfstash is heavily disconnected from reality, and it translates into reality as he avoids his feelings and accountability. Well, that's just ridiculous. I would never kill anybody. This disconnect that he maintains channels into his actions and thoughts, which then warps reality around him the deeper he goes into denial. The very absurdity that he radiates into the world comes from a place within him that is genuinely sad to see. The world isn't sad. The world's funny. I'm a sociopath. Warfstash is already interesting enough in how he can play with genre and tone and explore edgy shit without gut punching the audience. But there is one more aspect to him that I want to bring up. The aspect where he speaks directly and indirectly to us to help shape and bring home the meaning within Markiplier's work. And a great example of that is in In Space with Markiplier. So much space. I need to see it all. I'm in space. I'm in space. So initially, when Aswim was dropping trailers and hyping everyone up, I wasn't expecting an actual story out of it. I figured it'd be like Heist. Fun, with multiple stories to play through, and maybe one ending considered the true ending. I ended up playing the first part of space with my two younger brothers, one of which did not want to go home until we found the route that had Warfstash in it, since Warfstash was his favorite character. Warfstash's cameo was hidden well enough in Heist, but the way it was done in space, and what his cameo was about, is the entire reason why I made my theory video of In Space with Markiplier. First, there's the easter egg. In my theory video, I basically labeled any choice that you make as either a chaos choice or an order choice. Choices that make sense and help you save the day? Order choice. Choices that are absolutely absurd? A chaos choice. To get to the first easter egg, you essentially make order choices up to a point. This point is when Bandit shows up and offers to help you get back your ship with a probably mutually beneficial allyship. But Engineer Mark is against this idea, as he's almost always encouraging the viewer to make a chaos choice, for some reason. If you make the chaos choice and refuse help, like when you think about it story-wise, that's a choice that's almost more absurd than just popping her in reverse right away. You've come this far doing the right things, and now you're going to choose to do the most blatantly disadvantageous choice ever that would basically leave you stranded and in danger. So when you do make that choice, are you just picking choices at random, or are you merely exploring every nook and cranny to look for some kind of Easter egg? You want an Easter egg? You get an Easter egg. And there it is. Ooh, ah. Right after this, you can basically do the same thing over again, making another set of order choices, and you suddenly decide to fix it from the outside. And then before the main ending happens, you get a choice to either go into the main ending, or... Captain, hey. Captain, where are you going? Captain, we gotta fix the ship! Where are you going? 
No, no, that's bad. I know why you're here. You're looking for an Easter egg. No, wrong. That's bad. Go back to the main story. You're gonna find nothing here. Wait, main story? There, there, there's a main story? You're telling me that there's more going on and that searching for Easter eggs is against the whole point and disregards the lives of the crew? The crew lives that are easily to disregard because the absurdity level has been so high since the beginning. But actually, there is story and they do matter and my disregard for them is in and of itself a major component of the story? What? But you know, that's just a theory. Warfstash is, in Mark's most recent works, trying to point the viewer in the right direction, serving as a literary device in an interestingly meta way. In Wamalawa, he helps the viewers reconcile the unsolved mysteries of who killed Markiplier by revealing that they won't be making progress by overanalyzing every minute detail. You're too focused on the minutia of it. The details, the who killed who, the who slept with who, like, it's it's not only just a message to Abe, it's a message to anybody watching it, because, um, it's, and it's not just tongue-in-cheek being like, eh, don't look into it too much, it's, it's important to remember that the viewer in this universe isn't just a person, it's character. The viewer is a character. That's something that cannot be forgiven or forgotten in anything that I do for these. The point of the story is literally being spelled out by him. He is also giving a message that I would argue applies to actor Mark as well as the viewer. You can tell all the stories you want to tell. It won't change what happened. You can't rewrite the past. If you live in fantasy forever, yourself in the story. Today, Warfstash has become so much more than just the butt of edgy jokes. Warfstash inspires and fascinates the fandom in ways that no other character has done, in a way that I cannot imagine being easy to replicate. He's a victim of circumstance and malevolence, and also a victimizer himself. He is painfully self-aware, and yet purposefully oblivious. He's sympathetic to people trying to navigate the world, but also a bit of a sociopath. He is the wackiest and most cartoony character Markiplier has ever made, but also the most raw and real. Darkiplier has the angst and romance, Actormark has theatrical presence and the most control of the story and lore, but no character Markiplier could ever make from here on will ever engage with us quite like Warpstash. Your stuff that I'm going to, and if I explain it to you, then it's not going to be a surprise. You know what I mean? Make sense? Yeah? What are the masks? I don't know what you're talking about. What? No one's wearing a mask. I don't know what you're talking about anyway. So yeah, the, like that's the point of everything that's